All right, good morning, guys. What I'd like you guys to do is put your cups down for a second, and everyone put your hands out like this for me. You can get back to your notes in a second. Go ahead and put your hands together, clasp your hands together, thumbs crossed, palms together, bend at the elbows like you're making a desperate prayer. Put up your first fingers, keep your thumbs crossed, your palms together, and I want you to stare at the gap in between your fingers, not at me, just at the gap in between your fingers, because in a second, those fingers are going to come together and touch, just like two powerful magnets. They're going to get closer and closer and closer together, and the more you try to pull them apart, the closer and closer they get, and your fingers will stick together. But you can pull your hands apart. They're not like stuck. I'm not going to hypnotize you or anything like that. You can pull your hands apart. When I was about five or six years old in downtown Omaha, Nebraska, I saw David Copperfield, and it changed my life. He walked through a wall, and then I went home and was like pushing against a wall, and my parents were like, eventually he'll just learn. Like, it's not going to work. But I've always been fascinated with magic and performers and storytellers and even stand-up comedians because they have the ability to take us out of our heads and more connected to our heart, more connected to our body. So often we get stuck in our head and it's our thinking that a lot of our problems are. When we watch a good performance, the performer has a way of bypassing our critical factor and I believe that attention is the currency of the mind. So they can bypass our critical factor, stimulate the unconscious mind. And it's kind of like a hypnotic formula in a way because when we're connected to what they're doing, the outside world just seems to vanish. It just seems to disappear. We're not worried about our taxes. We're not worried about our laundry or picking up our kids or going to the grocery store. All that stuff just seems to melt away. And if you've gone to a movie and you come out of the theater and light is kind of like an issue for you because you don't know how long you've been in there and you've had that time distortion, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Or we've had those moments where we say we're gonna read for like 15, 20 minutes, we pick up the book, an hour goes by, and then you check your phone, and you got a missed call and a couple texts that you had no idea that even came in. So we get in that zone where the outside world just disappears. When we're disconnected from ourselves, that's when we tend to get more up in our head. We believe our own thinking. We get trapped by our own thinking. And really, a belief is just a thought you keep thinking over and over again. So we get into these horrible prisons of our thinking. Now, some of you guys might agree with me on this, and some of them, some of this you won't, but that's fine. Either way is better. I believe that all of our problems are simply illusions. They're constructs in our mind that we've created. And as John mentioned earlier, we're constant change. We, as human beings, part of the human experience is that we have thoughts and we have emotions that come through us. But it's the language that we use that creates the parameters around these problems. It's the language that we speak out into the world, but there's also the language that we have in our head that does just as much of the work. The internal monologue that nobody else hears, but we're defining things that way as well. Let's try a little experiment, because I know some of you guys are thinking, well, when I'm in a problem, I can really feel it, and like I have a physical reaction. I used to do hypnotherapy, and people who even think of heights start to get clammy, their heart rate changes, their breathing changes, they start getting the sweats, just from thinking about like a snake or a spider. So why would we get a physical reaction to just our thinking? So close your eyes for a second. I'm not gonna steal your wallet or anything. I'll save that for the performance part. But close your eyes, and I want you to imagine that I hand you a lemon. And I hand you a knife, and you cut the lemon in half, maybe into quarters. And even then, you pick up one of the slices. You can see the yellow peel. You can feel the texture. Maybe you pick it up with your thumb and index finger, or maybe it's your thumb and your middle finger. But even as you start to bring that lemon slice to your mouth, you can already notice the colors, smell the citrus. You already start salivating just a little bit. And even when you bite into that sour, sour lemon and feel the juices run down your chin. That's right. And you can just allow your eyes to open. Because I notice a lot of you guys are salivating and kind of clearing your throats a lot, and, and I'm actually doing it too. I'm not any different than anyone else here. There's no lemons in the room that I know of, I don't think. But there's no lemons in the room. It's just our thinking, but we can have physical reactions to our thinking. It's kind of like a magician creating a magic trick, 
performing it in the mirror and completely fooling himself like every time with it. It's like, this is just amazing. I don't know how this works. Every time, it's just amazing. So we're kind of like fooling ourselves in a way. And the real secret to magic, I believe, is that the best hypnotist, the best magician that you will ever meet in your life, is actually sitting in your chair, and it's you. You're creating these illusions because magic doesn't happen in the hands of the performer. It happens in the minds of the spectators. And if we take magic and we kind of break it down for a second, I'm about to kind of jump into a rabbit hole, so bear with me. But if we take magic, it's kind of weird because you have to know what's possible, and at the same time, you have to know what's impossible for it to work. And most people don't really think of it that way, but even if we were to look at this, this is a watch. We all know it's a watch. It's not a Ferrari. It's not a delicious cup of cold brew coffee. It's not an, a llama. Uh, I, I don't know where that one came from. But we know like a, mil, a couple million things that we know that it's not. We don't think of all those things until we put our attention on it. So sometimes we're trapped in the what's possible and we're not thinking about what's impossible. Because magic is that contrast. It's that spot in the middle where it all comes together. Because without one, you don't have the other. If everything was possible, life would be boring. Like, everything would just happen. It would just be reality. There would be no magic. Imagine David Blaine going to the moon and doing a levitation. He's just like, yeah, that's, that's great, but kind of know how it's done. But if everything was impossible, it would be frustrating. We'd get overwhelmed. We'd start to beat ourselves up. Our self-talk would be horrible. We'd get frustrated, and it would just be just a horrible existence. So we need that contrast of both. Because in that contrast is where the magic lies. Without that contrast, a simple statement wouldn't be a life-changing insight that could change how you show up in the world. A simple observation could turn into a simple and powerful distinction that changes the course of your business, your connections, your relationships, how you parent your children. Ladies, if there was no contrast, Oprah would not have her aha moments. And try to imagine a world without Oprah. It's going to be a little tough. So we need that contrast. We need that kind of back and forth because you have to know what's possible to know what's impossible. And when we use language to define our problems and the illusions of our problems, we're kind of ruling things in and out unconsciously. I just lost my train of thought. It'll come back to me. Um, so what I want to do is I want to invite you guys to an idea. What if we were to see, all of, one, all of our problems as illusions, but also, what if we were to take on our problems the same way we take on solving a magic trick? When we see a performer perform magic, there's a couple things that happen, and to me, it's a powerful shift that most of us aren't really aware of. The first thing, is that we start to get comfortable in the uncomfortable. Magic will take us out of our comfort zone, and we're totally okay with it. We usually have a smile on our face when we sit there and we don't know what's going on. We're fooled and we love it for some reason, right? How often in life are we ever fooled and we like actually love being in that space? So we're comfortable in the uncomfortable. Another thing that magic does is it sparks curiosity. We get like just overwhelmed with curiosity. We try to solve anything. We try to put the square pegs in the round holes. We'll do anything it takes to try to figure out so we're not fooled. And we also create a certain resilience, too. If something goes wrong, we'll just kind of dust ourselves off. We'll try a different approach. If you ever talk to a magician on how they create a, a routine, uh, recently in an interview, Copperfield's team was interviewed, and they said an average illusion takes like seven to ten years before it's ever, like, they, they're happy with it. So they're trying things constantly. There's a resilience there. Imagine if we took that resilience, like even with a crossword or a Sudoku puzzle, we love solving problems. If we took that resilience and applied it to a different area of our life, imagine how your business would change if you were more resilient to your problems and finding the answer. Imagine how you'd be a different parent showing up, teaching your kids more resilience and how they'll change and that ripple effect that that will have. Another thing is the mindset around the way we look at magic. We're in a solutions-based mindset. 
We want to find the answers. We don't want to be fooled, although we might have a smile on our face. We want to be the problem solver. And the last thing is the quality of questions that we ask are totally different. Einstein said that we can't solve a problem on the same level of consciousness that created the problem. Magic, magic causes us to get deeper with the questions. We ask different questions, a different quality of questions. And a couple of years ago, Dr. John Demartini said to me, he's like, Luke, our quality of life is directly proportionate to the quality of questions that we ask. I thought that was so profound. So I want to leave you guys with a question. When we see a magician do a magic trick on TV, or even in person, why is finding the answer to that illusion more important than the illusion in your head that could completely change your life? Thank you. Um, I need two volunteers to help me out with this. Does anyone want to? Yeah, come on up and you, sir, come on up on the end. Cool. So as an attention artist, I like to shift people's attention around. And if you would be right over here. Cool. Um, no, 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 nothing at all. Got to move the watch and the ring. You'll, wa you'll know why in a minute. Cool. So do you guys actually know each other? No. In go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, so, as an attention artist, I like to shake up the way people think, what we can experience, um, and ultimately, how we experience the world. Go ahead and turn towards each other, and take a half step in a little bit, and turn just a little bit like this. Cool. So, you know what, take a half step back. Cool. Um, I want you guys, since the whole theme of this event is connection, I want you guys to make eye contact for a while and just connect with each other. And here's kind of the interesting thing. As you're connecting, notice how your breathing starts to get just a little bit more in sync. And even just kind of the softness around the eyes. In a second, I'm going to have you close your eyes. I want you to keep your eyes open. But I'm going to have you close your eyes. Don't open your eyes until I ask you. Don't say anything out loud until I ask you. Actually, turn just a little bit just like this. Cool. And turn just a little bit like this, just so the people on the ends can see. So close your eyes. And don't open your eyes until I ask you. Don't say anything out loud until I ask you. But you can get a sense of the hands moving and waving if I do this, right? It's kind of weird how we can actually get a sense of things changing, even though we don't know what that is. But keep your eyes closed. Don't open your eyes until I ask you. Don't say anything out loud until I ask you. Just pay attention to your senses, whether they're hot or cold, or tickling sensations. Open your eyes. What did you feel? feel movement on my face and behind, me, on my back. behind you? You felt something on your back? What did you feel? Uh, a touch. A touch? How many times? Uh, twice, I think. Okay. Because I didn't touch you, but I touched her twice. Crazy, right? I just go around the airport touching people all the time. It's, it's weird. Yeah. Take a half step back again. Cool. Just like this. And take a half step back. Hold out, turn towards me. Hold out your arm for a second, just like this. Hold out your hand, just like that. This time I want you to keep your eyes open. I'm going to close my jacket so you don't think my jacket does anything. So close your eyes for me. And you can get a sense of the light changing if I do this, right? Cool. So stay perfectly still. And just pay attention to your senses, whether they're hot or cold, or tickling sensations. Did you feel anything? No. Cool. Keep your eyes closed. Stay perfectly still. And just pay attention to your senses, whether they're hot or cold, or tickling sensations. Open your eyes. What did you feel? A tickle? Where? Point to specifically where. I didn't touch your arm. I touched his arm. <laughs> Lower your hands just a little bit, and close your eyes for me. Stay perfectly still. You can lower your hand all the way down. Okay. So starting now, just pay attention to your senses, whether they're hot or cold, or tickling sensations. Open your eyes. What did you feel? 
On your forehead? Wait, where else did you say? Okay, oh, above your eye. I thought you said your left thigh. I'm like, I, I didn't do it. <laughs> okay, so above your eye. So, yeah, yeah. Above my left. Yeah. Okay, cool. So, did it almost feel like a hair? Okay, because I actually put her hair on her forehead. We know I don't have it. Cool. Go ahead and uh, have a seat. Give him a round of applause. Actually, I need you. Uh, stay up here. Cool. Um, we're going to try something else, something a little bit more visual. Um, I've got here a fork and a spoon. Point to one of them. Okay, take the fork. You guys have seen the people that take a pen or a pencil, wave it up and down, right? Make it look like it's bending. I'm not really falling for that. <laughs> supposed to, supposed to, or you just kind of move it back and forth. It's supposed to look real cool. What I want you to do is just focus on the spoon. Yeah, hang on with the fork. Focus on the spoon, and I'm just going to give it a light rub. We're going to see if we can get just a little bit. Just like that. Blow on that for me. One more time. Check that one out. Make sure it's real. There's nothing on my hands. Nothing like that. Cool. We're going to try something a little bit different now that I have everyone's attention. <laughs> We're going to try something a little bit different. Even if I take the fork and just give it a little bit of a wave, imagine what it would be like if we put our attention on it and really just imagine it bending just a little bit. Just like that. And feel that. Make sure it's real. Because people are going to ask you about it later. So, yeah. Here's kind of the cool thing. Right in front of you guys, I'll see if I can get it to go just a little bit more. Just give it a little bit of a rub. Make sure that's real. Cool. Now, and you can keep that as a souvenir. Because I'm sure you came to this TEDx event going, God, I hope I get a fork. You know, like, uh, do you have any change on you? No. I have some quarters, but sometimes people will say it's kind of weird if I use mine. Does anyone have a quarter? No. Yeah? Cool. Uh, yeah, I'm not good at sports. It's, yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, take the quarter and... I want you to think of a time that you felt the most connected to yourself, like in the past maybe year or so, but a time that you really felt connected to who you're being. You got that? Cool. And what I want you to do is write something on there, write something on both sides, so then that way you can draw a picture if you want, a little symbolism, but mark on there something that represents that feeling of how you felt connected to yourself. Yeah. Uh, it can be different, either way. Either way is better. Perfect. Cool. Um, go and show this gentleman right here, since it's your quarter, right? Notice what it says on there. That way you can verify it. Cool. Come on back. Okay. So... What is, what is, oh, okay, a tree. I don't know if the camera guys can see that. I'll hold it here for a second. So a tree, so w tell me a little bit about this memory. So I started to do watercolor. And the first oh. Thing I did was a tree. And is that a cat? Yep. Okay. Um, you're, you're right-handed though, right? Yeah. Okay, let me see your left hand for a second. We're gonna try something. So we're gonna take the tree and the cat. What I want you to do is squeeze tight just like that, and in your mind, really squeeze tight. I didn't steal the coin or anything. It's in your hand, right? So squeeze tight, and I want you to imagine what it was like to be there in that moment when you felt totally connected to yourself. And are you the type of person that feels it more in your head, or do you feel it more in your chest when you're really connected? Chest, okay. So on a scale of 1 to 10, 10 being absolutely connected, how strong would you say that it is right now? Six? Okay. I was going to say, don't lie to make me look good, but you said a six, so that's good. Okay. Um, so really squeeze tight, and as you squeeze tight, imagine being there in that moment. And you can close your eyes. I'm not going to steal it or anything like that. So really focus on being there and notice the sensations that you had, the, the smells that were there, the colors that were there, the feeling. Maybe there was a breeze, but really be in that moment. 
And when you start to notice the senses, just as your breathing started to slow down just enough, and where would you say that number's at right now? Eight. Well, what would make it a nine? If you are actually there. Okay. <laughs> Aside from being there, what would make it a 10? So just actually close your eyes and just imagine yourself there and squeeze tight. The tighter you squeeze, the more empowered you feel, the more empowered, more connected you are to you. So think of a time, yeah, breathe even deeper and notice that connection, even as you start to sway just a little bit. But even just as you breathe in deeper, would you say it's at a nine? And let me know when it's at a 10. When you, when you feel that it's at a 10 and a confident 10, just turn your hand so it's, palm up, and you're holding the coin. You wrote the cat and the tree on there, and check it out. And you are the eyes and the ears of the audience, so what happened? The quarter bent. The quarter bent. We're going to try something else. Hold your hand out flat for me. I'm going to see if I can get this to go just a little bit more. Just like that. And there's a little souvenir for you. You can keep the fork. You can actually keep the spoon if you want that, too. <laughs> Sell that on eBay. Cool. Give her a round of applause. <laughs> so when we open ourselves up to magic, because I believe magic is a mindset, not a skill set. And when we open ourselves up to that and we connect to that, I think we're all capable of amazing things. Thank you.